I'll let uh, the first panelist uh, that we've got uh, coming in for this breakout section to, to carry on this the dialogue that we've started this morning that we heard with Chairman Perry, Chief Justice Hecht, about you know kind of the education component, um, certainly not only of, of the general managers and, and those on the front lines, but most importantly to our board members. Um, again, this is a great avenue that uh, we've worked really hard from a conference planning standpoint um, to really push and advance the dialogue and bring and, and engage the, the board members, you know, from your local individual areas and give it, get a more statewide perspective of, of understanding what all's going on. Um, and to begin that uh, with the intricacies of, of the water code in Chapter 36, is Bill Dugan. I'll let it, turn it over to him and let him introduce himself. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, my bio is in the, in the pamphlet there. I'm Bill Dugan. I'm at uh, Bickerstaff Heath, um, and I have, uh, I have been a, a licensed attorney for 30 years, and I've been practicing before groundwater or with groundwater districts for 29. Um, and I'm glad to be here. Um, where's Zach? I work, I work with Zach, and um, I have to tell you a story. We, were, um, we had a big hearing uh, lined up with the State Office of Administrative Hearings, and we were mulling around outside. Uh, actually, the hearing was canceled, and we were still there, and people were showing up. And um, somebody showed up and started talking to us and uh, started railing on lawyers and uh, calling them vipers and snakes. And uh, they finished doing that, and they turned to Zach and said, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a general manager of a district. He said, what do you do? I said, I guess I'm a viper and a snake. So <laughs> anyway, I, I won't, uh, hopefully I won't bite today. What I, you know, I, I was assigned intricacies of, of Water Code Chapter 36. I don't think Chapter 36 is really that intricate, uh, but there's some things in there that, you know, normally when we talk about Chapter 36 at these conferences, at least from a legal perspective, we're talking about rulemaking and enforcement and permitting and I thought well you know I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we never talk about uh, and and a lot of this you may already know but sometimes it it kind of sneaks up on us from a, from a legal perspective I know your lawyers know about this and the lawyers out there know it, but I thought um, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about governance of groundwater districts and some unusual things in the in chapter 36 then uh, some items touching directors Purchasing, which we never talk about, uh, open government, and then just lawsuits in general under Chapter 36. So um, we've heard a lot. Here's a list of the laws affecting groundwater districts in Chapter 36. Um, we heard yesterday and today about the Conservation Amendment. That's uh, basically the, the birthright of, of a water districts, including groundwater districts. So we start with the Constitution, then we go to our operating manual, which is Chapter 36 of the Water Code. But we can't forget that if your district was created by the legislature, it has uh, its own enabling legislation. And everything I talk about this afternoon, you need to footnote, look at the enabling legislation because it may override Chapter 36. So that's either in the special district's local law code or uh, if it hadn't been codified yet, it's in one of the session laws. But one of the interesting things in Chapter 36 is this provision that says that other laws governing um, water districts, citing the constitutional amend uh, amendments, other laws governing water districts uh, shall not apply to a district governed by Chapter 36. Okay, so, and then Chapter 36 prevails over other laws in conflict except for the enabling legislation. So what does that mean? Other laws don't apply to a Chapter 36 district. Well, this was, this provision, and when you first think about it, say, well, our, our focus is really narrow. It's just Chapter 36 of the Water Code. But this provision was written back when when the chapter of the Water Code governing groundwater districts is Chapter 52, and we also had Chapter 50, and Chapter 50 applied to all, ground, all water districts. So every time we had to figure out something, whether or not, you know, what's the answer for a Chapter 52 district, we had to go look at Chapter 50. And uh, at some point, uh, Chapter 50 became 49 of the Water Code, and Chapter 30, 52 became 36, and we said, enough's enough. I know Greg Ellis was instrumental in, in, in that language being added to the statute. But enough's enough. From the water code perspective, we only have one statute we have to look at, and that's Chapter 36, except look at your enabling legislation because some groundwater districts say Chapter 49 applies. But anyway, uh, so for in general, Chapter 36 is the only water code ch uh, chapter we have to look at. 
Does that mean chapter 36 is the only law we have to look at? No, it doesn't. Here's a list of other laws that chapter 36 specifically references. Uh, these laws are mentioned. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to go pull these out of the air. They're listed in chapter 36, and I'm not going to read these to you, nor am I going to talk about most of these, but it's just important to know uh, that there are a lot of laws out there, and even though we have that general provision I just read, there are other things that affect the district. So let me talk about, let me move to, to the directors. There's an interesting provision on eligibility that says that a member of a governing body of another political subdivision cannot serve, can, is ineligible to be a director in a groundwater district. What does that mean, a member of a governing body of another political subdivision? Well, Chapter 36 defines what a political subdivision is, and, you know, it's the kind of things you think about, you know, county, city, school district, other water district. Uh, but it also includes a water supply corporation. So when we just read this by itself, without going to the next provisions I'm going to get to, if you're on a school board, then you can't serve as a groundwater district director according to this provision. Or if you're on the if you're on a WSC board of directors, you can't also be a groundwater district director. Well, um, and and what happens is you're disqualified and you vacate the office uh, if you uh, are dual office holding is is what we call it. So th this whole concept is dual office holding. You can't hold two you can't hold two public offices is what has been codified here. But there are exceptions to this. Uh, we know that in the, in the counties that are uh, low populated that um, there, there's just so many people that want to serve on these uh, governing bodies of these dif different institutions. So the legislature changed, or, uh, changed chapter 36. It said that this prohibition doesn't apply if your district has a population of less than 50,000. So, okay, we're cured, right? Not necessarily. Chief Justice this morning talked about the common law, the common law, the case law. Well, there's this whole body of case law out there called uh, the doctrine of incompatibility. And there was an AG opinion that said, I think it was a school district and a groundwater district, and it said, hey, even though the statute says that it doesn't apply to a, a, a district with less than 50,000, if you're sitting on the school board, and you're sitting on a groundwater district board, and both these entities have the power to uh, levy ad valorem taxes, then there's something incompatible that could be going on here. That could influence your decision about what the tax rate's going to be on one or the other. Uh, so under the common law, you can't sit on both uh, public bodies. Well, the legislature came in in 2003, and as the Chief Justice said this morning, the legislature can change the common law, they changed the common law when it, when it came to this doctrine of incompatibility for groundwater districts. Uh, and it, you're not disqualified for either being on the board or on the other political subdivision if you're in a population of less than 50,000 and it's not a city or, or a county that you're sitting on. So another little tweak or tidbit in, in chapter 36. Another one that's always interesting to me, uh, and I always have to think about this when I have board mem members absent from a meeting, is that to have a quorum of the board, um, to, to, to have a meeting, you need a quorum of a board, which is uh, the majority of the, of the board uh, meeting. So that's, that's a quorum. And to make a decision under Chapter 36, it says you have to have a concurrence of the majority of the entire membership of the board. Okay, so what does that mean? If you have a five-member board and you got two members absent, you got three members and you have a board meeting, you've got a quorum, right? So you can have a meeting. You got three, three out of five. Well, this language says that all three of those have to vote in the same way in order to advance a motion. So if it's 2-1, it doesn't advance. Now, check the enabling legislation, some of the districts have in their enabling legislation that a vote of a quorum of the board is required, a majority vote of the quorum of the board is required for board action. So this, you usually see this in boards in their enabling legislation where they have, you know, a larger number, maybe seven or more. Uh, I don't know if I've seen it in any, any five-member boards. Maybe some of y'all have that in your enabling legislation. But, 
you know, be aware of that. Uh, you, if, if, if you don't have it uh, in your enabling legislation, you need to be aware that sometimes it takes, you know, a, if you have a seven member board and only, uh, you only have a bare uh, quorum there, it takes all of them to, to, uh, to pass a motion. Uh, this is another little tidbit out of, out of chapter 36 that, you know, we probably don't really think about, but, you know, who can, who can execute documents on behalf of the district? What, what chapter 36 says is that the board president is the CEO, presides over all meetings, and shall execute, shall execute all documents on behalf of the district. Then it says that the board secretary shall attest those documents. Now, it does allow for the board to name a, uh, a deputy secretary or an assistant secretary, and I know many boards do that because sometimes your secretary will be absent, the board secretary will be absent. Um, but Chapter 36 also says the board may designate the GM basically uh, all authority to manage the district, and in some instances uh, the, the board has designated certain contracts to be executed by the GM. Let me turn to purchasing. Um, there's not a lot in Chapter 36 about purchasing. Um, here in 36057, it says you have the right to purchase. You know, okay, we have the right to purchase. The first mention of purchasing, uh, besides this general provision, is a provision dealing with the Professional Services Procurement Act. And Chapter 36 says that it that the district shall use the Professional Services Procurement Act when selecting this list of uh, professionals, attorneys, engineers, auditors, financial advisors, or other professional consultants, whatever that means. Now, when you go to the Professional Services Procurement Act, here's the list that that act, that's 2254 of the government code, this is, what, this is the list of what that act applies to. Well, you don't see on that list attorneys, financial advisors, or other professional consultants. So I don't know, I don't know how the attorneys, how we got this, how we didn't fix this so that, you know, groundwater districts have to use the Professional Services Procurement Act to, you know, get attorneys, but you have to, all right? And you have to, you have to do it for financial advisors, other professional consultants, um, and it's not hard to comply with that act. Uh, it basically says you can't, you can't get bids, you can't use competitive biddings, you have to select on the, on the uh, uh, professional competence um, and qualifications and based on a reasonable price. Uh, now on engineers um, and surveyors, I think the Professional Services Procurement Act specifically says uh, you have to select the best qualified, negotiate the contract, and then set the price. So there's a little twist there, but it's always a little dance to be able to work through this act uh, to get your consultants. But be aware that uh, that obligation is out there. Uh, there's two other provisions in Chapter 36 about purchasing. One is that it says you can purchase from, the, from another governmental entity by negotiated contract. And then there's a provision that says a district may use reverse, uh, I said action here, but it means it should say auction, the reverse auction procedure. Anybody done reverse auction procedure? I've never done it. Uh, you know, a regular auction, you think like a livestock auction, the seller is, uh, is looking for bi people to bid on something. On a reverse auction, the, the, the purchaser is the one looking for people to bid. So they, they also call that a Dutch auction. And you, it's a, the, the uh, procedure is in another statute um, and it's, um, it's done um, through the internet electronically. Um, but I, I don't know of anyone, I don't know, has anyone ever used that anywhere? I don't know anybody that's ever used that. So it's in the water code though. It's one of those intricacies. So, yes sir. There you go. Used a water right. Okay. Interesting. Um, however, there are some other provisions and some other codes that I believe implicate the purchasing by a groundwater district. Um, chapter 271 of the local government code says that a, I'm, I'm, you can read it, but basically a governmental agency uh, may execute and perform contracts for any personal property and, and the, 
the provisions of 271 apply. Governmental agency under 271 includes a water district. But when you go read that statute, it directs counties to go under one chapter of the government code, local government code and cities to go somewhere else. It doesn't say anything about where the water districts are supposed to go. So um, it's, it's really kind of an open question about you know, how you would pursue that. Um, I think the safe thing is, um, is, is to follow that act as closely as you can um, because some of the bidding uh, or some of the purchasing requirements um, have some stiff penalties if you don't follow them. Um, chapter 2269 of the government code applies to a public works contract um, and it includes, when you look at the definition of public works, it includes uh, a special district. The best I can tell a public works would be is like a building. If you're going to build a building, I think 2269 uh, kicks in. Um, an interesting question would be whether or not a well would be a public works. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, to flesh this out, a district might be interested in working on rules that would define what a public works contract is, but there's not a lot of districts that are building buildings out there, um, so it may not really affect you. Um, let me turn to another intricacy of Chapter 36. This is open meetings. I know uh, directors and, and employees are really intimate with open meetings, but there's, there's an interesting provision in Chapter 36. That, you know, it, it generally says that the Open Meetings Act uh, applies to a groundwater district, except for a meeting where a DFC is adopted. Well, that exception doesn't accept it out of open meetings. It just has more notice requirements than a regular open meeting. But then there's a, this provision that says, neither failure to provide notice of a regular meeting nor an uh, insubstantial defect in the notice of any meeting shall affect the validity of any action taken at that meeting. So if you read that, it says, neither failure to provide notice of a regular meeting. If you don't notice, according to this, if you don't notice a regular meeting, it doesn't affect the action taken at that meeting. That's what chapter 36 says. Now, I don't think this provision's ever been tested. I wouldn't test it. Uh, the, open, the Open Meetings Act is really clear that you have to have notice of that meeting. And, you know, there are provisions that, you know, having a meeting without notice can be a, interpreted as a closed meeting and there are uh, criminal penalties involved with that. So, you know, I, I like that language, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to test it. Um, let's see, what else? I think that's all on open meetings. Um, no, okay, there's another provision in um, regarding open meetings. Uh, we all have committees of the board that are uh, members of the board that are less than a quorum. And Chapter 36064 says you can do that, and that if it's less than a quorum, then um, you're not subject to the provisions of the Open Meeting Act. Now, chap now, the Open Meeting Act says something different. There's some AG opinions out there that says even if you're a committee of the board that's less than a quorum, if you are a decision-making body and, and the full board is just going to rubber stamp what you do, then you are subject to the Open Meetings Act, to the notice uh, requirements, the minute taking and whatnot. So here's another provision where 36 gives, is, is, is less strict than the Open Meetings Act. This provision has actually been tested, uh, not, not the Chapter 36 provision, but there's a provision, a similar provision in Chapter 49 of the Water Code, uh, and it upheld that provision. Uh, but again, you know, I just don't like to test the Open Meetings Act. Open records, uh, we're subject to open records, um, and uh, you're, you're also subject to uh, retention of documents under the Local Government Records Act. Uh, let me talk about lawsuits. There's four provisions governing lawsuits in Chapter 36. One of them is this loser pay provision, or it's not loser pay yet, but Chapter 36, Section 36066. The, this provision says that a district um, can, uh, if it wins, it gets its attorney fees and expert witness fees. 
It was modified in 15 that says in the interest of justice. There's another provision on rule enforcement that says if the district prevails in enforcing its rules, it gets its attorney's fees. It doesn't have any of this language that uh, accepts it out. Um, and I'm going to skip that because I'm running out of time. There's a provision on DFCs, what kind of lawsuits are affected by that. The important thing to know that is it's under the substantial evidence rule. I'm going to talk about that in a second. This is the general, another general provision affecting lawsuits that anyone who's aggrieved by the board can sue the board, but if it's in a permanent action, only the applicant, a party to the contested case, uh, and that district can participate, the burden's on the petitioner, it's by the substantial evidence rule. This is a substantial evidence rule, don't try to read it. What's important about it is it's the same rule that state agencies have when they are sued uh, and appealed in Travis County. The important stuff is that it the, is this term substantial evidence. What does that mean? Well, it means that a court cannot substitute its judgment for the judgment of the GCD with regard to the weight of the evidence, it must, the evidence has to preponderate, I love that word, preponderate, and that means way towards, hope the Aggies preponderate against UCLA, uh, in determining, uh, and, and it has to just be a little more than a scintilla of evidence. So when you hear legislation that wants to affect the district's ability to rely on the substantial evidence rule, it's a big deal, and this is the provision that deals with it. Finally, uh, there's a validation statute in Chapter 36 that says that if you've done something that's basically uh, three years, uh, after three years, uh, and a lawsuit hasn't been filed, then it's been validated. And there's some, there's some, I keep pointing down there, but there's some uh, provisions that it doesn't apply to, but it, this is a pretty strong provision. There's no Chapter 36 case that interprets this. It's used in by, there's similar provisions by cities. Um, it's usually used by city to uphold an ordinance that's been challenged because of defect in notice. That would apply to some defect in rulemaking. If it's more than three years old, then you could rely on this validation statute, but it's also been used to validate substantive acts by cities as long as they're not constitutional acts. So I don't think you could validate an unconstitutional taking if it's more than three years old. So um, that's about all I have. I think I'm out of time anyway. Um, I, oh, want, any questions? I was at a church meeting one time as a young lawyer. I mean, you know, church is supposed to be a safe haven. And somebody from the diocese was there, and we had to go around the room and tell each other what we did. And I said, I'm a lawyer. And he goes, you know what? You, how you tell when a lawyer's lying? Y'all all know this. Yeah, when they open their mouth, okay? I said, that kind of hurt my feelings. I said, I'll just ask you questions, then I won't be lying about anything. So <laughs> there, good to see, talk to y'all. Thank you. <laughs>